Welcome back to the Career Now podcast. I'm your host, Jedley Henry, as always. And in today's podcast, we have a returning guest. This is Albert Park. Now, Albert was on the podcast oh, um, over a year ago now to talk about uh, Christianity and religion and how they rose and how they developed within Korea. And I'm going to link that below. And it does offer some important insight into today's podcast, if for nothing else than just the period involved itself and all the surrounding aspects and what changed. But today we're going to talk about uh, ag- agrarianism, environmentalism, and the change of Korean landscapes and farming practices over the years. And of course, this is with Albert Park. Albert is an associate professor at Claremont McKenna University and an and, and historian of modern Korea and East Asia. So, Albert, welcome back to the podcast. Hi, Chad. Thanks for having me back. So it is a pleasure to come back. Your first podcast was received really well by the by the listeners. So yeah, they will be happy to have you back, as I am. So, uh, but as a first step here, when we get into this process, we might want to wind it back to a, a slightly deeper history of the period. So let's go back to the Choson period and what agricultural life looked like, because you've written that um, it was revered. It was revered in this period, so it has this uh, valuable source of, of wealth. It, grow, it drove economic uh, development, and peasants and farmers were often looked at as uh, pillars of the nation in some way. So let's go back to Chosun, Korea, and how agriculture and farming practices and farmers were seen. Sure. Um, so if you look at the Chosun period, um, agriculture – was essentially kind of the source of all wealth in the country. I would say from the beginning of Chosun, the middle of Chosun, even to the late, late Chosun period. Um, and it was this, this idea of agriculture as a source of wealth um, was no different than the connection between agriculture and social wealth in other countries uh, like um, yeah, like England or France and other Western countries. So um, with that kind of connection, you know, peasants and uh, anyone working on the land were theoretically revered. In other words, um, they were valued for the uh, working the land, producing agricultural crops and goods that would either be eaten or used for making some type of uh, product and and so forth. And I I say theoretically because in reality, of course, um, there there were uh, uh, people who, of course, looked down upon the peasants and uh, mistreated peasants too, particularly the Yangban landlords. Um, but nevertheless, agriculture uh, as a practice was was very much valued. And um, it, it, if you look at the chosen period, there are segments where agriculture um, mo- is, is, is transformed, modified um, in terms of its scale and its impact on society. Um, I, I mean, I'll be happy to go over that Um with you if you're if you're more interested um but what i will say is that before let's say the 1600 um agriculture uh, did very well but after 1600 you definitely saw um an increase in agricultural productivity which uh, many um academics today who work on chosen period uh, uh argue that um there were signs of uh, a capitalist activity through agriculture in the late chosen period. Well, yeah, that's that's pause there for a moment. I wasn't going to ask, but that is that is really interesting. That change. So uh, let's let's go there for a moment and explain just what was happening at that period, because I think many people have this expectation that uh, things changed uh, only when the, when Japanese colonization came in and this imposed these top down regulations. But let's go back to that period. What was it that was changing, and what were those conditions there? Well, I think um, I think you have to start. Uh, by looking at, again, what is the connection between agriculture and capitalism? And um, interestingly, whenever people talk about the origins of capitalism, and this is not only the general public, but also academics, um, they often argue or say that, well, capitalism started off with industrialization, like in, in, in urban centers, which we're very familiar with today. But if you look at 
uh, the his- history of like England, France, and and other countries that had a deep agriculture traditions. Uh, frequently, you you see agriculture being kind of the um, uh, the force that uh, produces these elements of capitalism um, and and lays the foundation for the creation of a capitalist system in in the modern era. Now, when you apply it to, when you think about the chosen period, there are multi th- multiple things happening. Uh, historically, let's say in the uh, 1600s, more 1700s, um, you're starting to see... Um, uh, agricultural cultivators, um, you know, uh, working the land differently because they come up with different types of plows and different types of tools. Um, they're also experimenting with different types of seeds, and you're 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 seeing that the combination of these, let's say, technological innovation um, and innovation and in seed production and usage of, of of the seeds, all of that is kind of coming together, and what what it's what 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 it was producing was um, um, more um, let's say uh, uh, an excess of crops that um, the peasants themselves or agricultural cro- cultivators uh, um, couldn't con- couldn't consume themselves because we have to remember during this period um, the majority of people when they farm or engage in agriculture, you're mostly doing for self, self-subsistence, uh, just for self-consumption, right? To um, make enough rice, make enough grain so that you can um, feed off of that um, uh, supply for the year. But because of these innovations you're, and changes, you're starting to say, oh, I'm, I'm producing a little bit more. And what you're noticing is that um, peasants, agricultural cultivators, um, they start selling them the on a market, right? They would go to like the Changshi, which is the five day market, and start selling some of their access, or maybe selling it to a merchant. And what this is doing then is kind of um, producing all this type of activity, right? Where you're starting to see um, uh, um, agricultural cultivators producing, trading their goods with with people in the market and the people in the market are then taking the agricultural goods that they receive and trading with something else. So what you're starting to see, of course, is just this um, economic activity that some historians are saying uh, mirrors capitalist activity, right? And uh, perhaps people are now starting to agricultural cultivators are producing for, want to produce for excess good for a profit. Right, which is one of the main components of capitalism, uh, characteristics of capitalism. So um, I think what you need to really carefully look is all these little innovations and changes is happening in the 1700s and 1800s and how collectively then they produce these other wide scale changes um, that many people would say lead to the foundation of capitalism. And that question of capitalism will come back in later in the podcast for sure. But and also you're talking about the, that change. So that's that step forward uh, from that period and perhaps contrast the two. So uh, the Japanese colonial period comes about uh, in, in, I suppose, 1910 is where we can start it from. But uh, the change at this time, I mean, I, 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 I'm assuming that those capitalist changes that you're that you're speaking about just then during the Chosun period, they were probably ground up. They weren't imposed by the Chosun state. But uh, the Japanese um, colonial period is this time where this it, it's not just just a, a change in the system, but it seems to also be a, a change from how the system is controlled. Uh, the government steps in in a very strong way and a very um, a, a way it hasn't been seen before, it appears at the time, and starts to try and control agriculture. So uh, I might get a talk about the differences of what changed and just what this Japanese colonial period looked like. Right. And I, I think you hit it exactly when you said that during the chosen period, um, the the government or let's say the 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 chosen um, government um, never kind of um, uh, supported or uh, encouraged this type of what people say is capitalist activity. Um, 
and in large part because uh, they were uh, motivated and influenced by other belief systems like Confucianism um, and other belief systems that uh, were uh, quite critical of certain type of economic behavior. Um, so for sure in the chosen, let's say before 1875 or let's say 1860s when um, at that time when Korea is becoming um, incorporated into the modern world system. Up until that, you don't see the government necessarily take active encouraging like, you know, um, capitalist entrepreneurship. Um, they do, of course, support and provide for infrastructure creation, water drainage, creating dams and so forth. But for the government, that was um, the chosen government, they, they believed they had a moral responsibility to the agricultural cultivators and the peasants to help them uh, produce. Um, so, and how do you help them produce? By um, helping them with infrastructure. So, it, but it definitely wasn't because they wanted to create this new capitalist system. Now, I think that changes when you go into the late 19th century. Um, and I think there's two kind of agents. So there's the chosen state and then the Japanese government, um, who is rapidly trying to kind of in create, um, trying to influence domestic affairs in Korea. Um, you see the Chosun dynasty um, and under King Kojong and, and so forth, uh, wanting to create a new agricultural system. And the agricultural system will be based on capitalist principles. And in large part, um, the belief of an agricultural system uh, created um, uh, based on capitalist principles, uh, it was drawn from a lot of the ideas and coming from, from the West. And when, I, when we talk about system, a system is entities, right? Entities that are, uh, it, a system is made up of various entities that work together um, to produce or to create something or, or to, to do something. And so um, King Kojong and, and, and the late Chosun dynasty uh, wanted to uh, make sure that you had all these agricultural entities working together so that you can create this new uh, wealth, the wealth that would allow Korea to uh, sustain its sovereignty and independence. And uh, of course, um, you know, they're unable to do that because the Japanese colonial government um, uh, is established. They, you know, Japan colonizes Korea. And what Japan, the colonial government does is to um, build even a more elaborate system, a system that is fully concentrated um, and controlled by um, the, the colonial government. And it's this elaborate system in which the colonial government is overseeing um, all these different entities. So they're creating a market, they're gonna create all the support for agricultural cultivators, they're gonna build new schools of agricultural schools to so that people will learn how to increase production. And, and this colonial state serves as this central force to bring everything together, to create a system. And, and this system, of course, um, was created so that you could produce enough agricultural goods to benefit the Japanese empire, um, particularly the Japanese needed cheap and expensive rice. Um, so yeah, so you, the, 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 the system creation of agricultural system creation, uh, definitely, um, uh, is, is rapidly increasing in the late 19th century. So that idea that the uh, Japanese period, that they definitely uh, definitively wanted to grow their agricultural production, they needed rice, they needed to support war effort and uh, expanding colonization. But uh, there's this moment and th there's these two plans. So let, let's, let's talk about the 1920 plan and the 14-year and the plan. This is 1926. And mm -hmm. it, it, it seems so there's a whole series of things that seem to happen around this period. But... Uh, a lot of it seems to be a way not just to dramatically improve agriculture, but it also seems to be tied together with growing unrest in, in the countryside at, at, at the time. So there's also the rural revitalization campaign, and there's all these programs that are, are targeted towards peasants and farmers. And it's about loyalty to the emperor and trying to increase a number of things, but also 
uh, not just increase production and make them better citizens, but also calm these unrest because there's, uh, there's this uh, not uh, uh, not just a growing unrest, but there's also rice riots and protests. So uh, that's a big question there. But let's take us to that that unease and uh, and that complex situation. Sure. I mean, I think you perfectly said there's there's so many things happening because of um, agricultural and and rural issues. And so if we so let let's just let's just kind of as I mm-hmm. mentioned before, let's just start here. Where why does Japan need Korea? Well, it needs Korea for inexpensive agricultural goods, particularly rice, right? And the re- why does why does Japan need inexpensive rice. Well, you are, uh, as Japan is rapidly urbanizing and industrializing, so you have rapid urbanization and industrialization happening together, you're having less people farm in Japan, and that means you're having less production. And what does that mean? You you don't have enough rice necessarily to um, feed um, the entire population, particularly in the city. Um, and whatever rice there is, it's going to be really expensive, which then leads to all these types of rice riots in Japan. Um, I mean, there's there's far more details to the, the, the cause of rice riots. And so I don't want to reduce it to just what I just said. But mm. um, that's, the I think, the basic gist. And so when you get to Korea, well, okay, they produce all this rice, soybeans, cotton. Um, and when the colonial government... Um, is established um, in 1910 and even into 1920, they're doing whatever they can to increase production. And um, and I've, I've spoken this a bit in my um, other writings and presentations, and I'm currently writing my book manuscript on this, but, you know, Korea, environmentally speaking, the soil is very poor, Um it's very poor because um, uh, there's a lot of acidity in it. And in addition to that, there's a lot of disruptions in soil where um, because uh, uh, Korea is very mountainous, the peninsula, and you have a lot of um, rainfall, um, you have rain, of course, then going on the mountains, coming rushing down, and there's th- constantly disrupting soil. And from what I've learned from my scientists that I kind of talk to and, and I collaborate with, that's not good for soil. You, soil can't be disrupted in that way. Um, so there's a, there's all these um, issues, uh, environmentally speaking, with that make it prove it to be a ch- challenging to produce a, a, um, a agricultural crops in a, uh, abundance. Um, so... Um, and on top of that, you have peasants who are used to farming in a certain way. They're not necessarily incorporating "quote unquote" modern technology, modern seeds, and so forth. They're they're in the eyes of colonial government very uh, traditional. So, what do you need to do? The colonial government comes in 1920 and in the 1920s and into the 1930s, set up these various um, programs to increase rice production, programs to increase soybean production, um, and what that means is they um, uh, they uh, give a lot of money and a lot of aid to uh, agricultural cultivators um, to increase their production to become modern. Um, agricultural c- cultivators l- like you would find in the West. Now, um, the key thing here is the colonial government has its limits, and so they need to depend on um, limits in terms of how much resources and, 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 and labor that they can uh, um, kind of use to oversee these these programs. And so um, the colonial government relies on the, Yangban, the former Yangban landlords, so the major Korean landlords or the Japanese landlords to implement their um, policies to increase production, which then some, uh, this goes to your point about rural unrest, there is already a built-in tension between a lot of peasants and landlords because peasants don't own land, they rent it. Landlords um, vary um, in Korea, but there are many stories of you have these terrible landlords who mistreat their peasants, right? Um, abuse them in many ways, um, and so this, this, so there's this built-in tension already when these campaigns are starting to increase production. And then also, the colonial government says, "Look, 
the landlords have even more power um, to determine how you're going to farm. So this causes a, even some some even more tension. And you do have a lot of rural unrest in the 20s and into the 30s, especially after the start of the Great Depression, when um, which severely affects the peninsula in many ways. So, um, so agricultural uh, policies do kind of increase rural tension between the peasants and um, the landlords, and that lasts all the way into the 30s. And by the 40s, it changes a bit because wartime conditions, um, wartime mobilization kind of stamps down any type of um, peasant protest. But yeah, it's definitely there, that unrest. Well, let's step beyond the war and to an independent Korea and the changes that have happened because it seems from reading that uh, after Korea becomes independent and the colonial period is over, that the new government, particularly when Park, uh, Park Chung-hee comes to power, uh, and they have this focus on not just capitalistic growth, but on uh, labor-intensive manufacturing. Once this comes to place, uh, this um, has a... Um, a, a huge squeeze in effect, a tightening effect on the agricultural sector. So it is again, it is it is uh, it's it's increasingly losing its luster and its place that it had as this vanguard of Korean society. And again, throughout this this period, it feels like as Korea develops, uh, the manu- this agricultural sector is squeezed again and again and again. And uh, not just that, but they also lose in, of course, they. They're losing land to manufacturing. They're losing manufacturing. They're losing workers to manufacturing jobs. It seems like uh, there is a, a almost like a, like a continuation of the process of, of sorts that was happening uh, once uh, Korea becomes independent, and particularly once Park Chung Hee comes to power. Yeah, I mean, I think you're right, definitely about. Um... You know, I like the word squeezed. I mean, the, the agriculture cultivators, farmers are being squeezed by the government and central authorities. And this is not only Park Jung Hee, but even before that was Sim Min Rhee. And even I would, and I'm, I'm, I'm writing a chapter right now looking at, um, in my book, looking at the United States military government from 1945 to 1948, basically squeezing the farmers to produce as much rice as they can in a very, I would say, a very authoritarian way. Um, and so you know, why is this happening, right? That's the question. Why does this pattern happen, right, that that existed, that started basically since the colonial period? Well, you have to again think about, it. well, um, farmers produce a valuable commodity. They produce agricultural crops that can either be eaten, consumed, or can be used to be traded or make or manufacture, um, you know, make clothing, right, with the cotton they produce or the silk or or other types of, um, uh, of, of uh, textiles and so forth. So, um, so farmers have such a valuable role in society. And if you look at um, from 45 all the way up until 1980, Farmers are really being asked, you, you have to produce. You have to produce a lot of inexpensive agricultural crops. And, um, and under Park Jung-hee's era, um, you're seeing mass urbanization, um, mass industrialization in cities where people are just flocking to from the rural areas. And so in that moment, you, what do you need? You need inexpensive rice to feed the 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 urban kind of uh, people in the cities, and so this is where the responsibility lies on the farmers um, in the countryside in the rural areas. And so again, you want to squeeze them for as much as they can produce. And how do you do that? Well, you have to have a centralized kind of effort to do that. And so just like I would say in the colonial period where the Japanese colonial government had these top-down movements to mobilize the farmers to produce more, you see that as well in the um, 60s and 70s uh, by um, the use of various types of mechanisms like uh, nong help, right, which um, I'm sure your listeners are very familiar if you're in Korea, right? It's, 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 it's called an agricultural cooperative when in fact I would say it's by far nothing like an agricultural cooperative, but it, when it was founded, it was a, a state organization that uh, played a role in um, mobilizing farmers to produce a certain amount of 
of of um, agricultural crops um, for the for the for the country, and to do it in a very specific way, particularly using a lot of chemicals, a lot of fertilizer, a lot of pesticides um, that ended up really polluting a lot of lands and really sickening a lot of farmers. So there was a lot of environmental costs through this kind of squeezing of the farmers. But I, I think you know the Again, why is this happening? Well, it's because the central role of farmers in uh, in kind of nourishing the, the national body, right? They 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 literally produce the food that nourishes bodies. These bodies that need to work hard um, in factories or um, in the cities um, as they're as in people doing business and uh, other areas. So um, it's, it's, I have to say, I mean, I, I could talk more about it, but it, it's, it's really tragic, I think, the way that rural farmers are treated in modern Korean history. Let's, uh, step, you touched on it briefly there, but let's step into this. Uh, uh, again, this is a this is a policy initiative or a, a I suppose uh, instantiation of government here that, that that comes about that many people have probably heard of and this is the new village movement this is 1971 mm -hmm. so I, I might get you to explain just what that was what was the pressures that caused it to come about what what was the purpose of it and uh, how did it operate so right so the same undong the new village movement um, as you mentioned starts early 1970s and it's this a uh, drive to modernize agriculture as well as modernize the rural areas. Um, the story goes that Park Jung-hee uh, was very concerned about the kind of disjuncture or disequilibrium between the urban and rural where, um, you know, by the 70s and 80s, uh, there are more and more people moving to the uh, urban cities, urban areas. And, um, and, and, and making money and increasing their wealth. Whereas in the rural areas, it's a little bit more, appears to be a little bit more um, uh, stagnant in terms of their uh, accumulation of wealth. And so um, Park Chung-hee, the story goes, is very concerned about this and um, decides to start a new movement to provide, um, you know, to provide money, uh, to provide uh, new um, technology, new seeds, so that farmers can be um, can increase their production and 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 become wealthier. Um, now, I think the real story, the real reason is Park Jung Hee wants to modernize, um, start the same world movement um, because he wants to increase rice production, increase agricultural production. Um, so. Um, the the same mo movement is very elaborate. Um, so, uh, like I said, they provide uh, money, they provide um, new seeds, they provide all this new technology for farming. They also provide a lot of resources to build homes um, for for villages to kind of make repairs to buildings um, to in in the whole in the with the idea of to, to modernize. Um, and I would say that. Um, you know, the way that it's been framed, the same on Undong, um, to some academics, uh, it, it, they, they uh, interpret it as a very top-down authoritarian movement that restricted um, farmers and what they did, um, which I think is very true. Um, again, um, the government through the same on Undong promoted chemical-based farming. Um, and if you, if you didn't um, follow chemo this chem the the policies of the government through the same undong, then you would be ostracized. Uh, literally, you wouldn't get access to um, the resources and support you need. And interestingly enough, a lot of farmers would call anyone who wanted to do organic farming what they would call them communists, right? Because they're so different, right? They, um, they, of course, they weren't accusing the saying that oh, they're really like North Korean communists, but because these farmers were doing something so different. Like organic farming, that they had to, and they, that that meant they're going against the state. And if you're going against the state, you're a communist. So, so that's one set. But there's, you know, there's other people who argue that Samar Undong did increase the wealth of the rural side, which it, there is some argument to there, um, and provided aid and and so forth. And if you look at the what farmers said, a lot of people took advantage of the state program and were able to 
um, strengthen their um, households, their finances, and so forth. So, um, you know, I, I try to be careful here. I mean, I, I think it's more of an authoritarian top-down movement, but I also want to acknowledge here that, um, you know, people, farmers, um, some of them really value this Myeongdong. I really hope you're enjoying this episode of the podcast and I apologize for this interruption, but I'm just going to take this moment to remind our listeners that we've made a conscious decision here in the Korean App Podcast not to run advertising in any way. So if you do enjoy the podcast and you listen regularly and you do want it to continue, it is important that you do your best to support us at the links below or by sharing, liking or commenting on the podcast across social media. All your help in this regard is invaluable. And now back to the episode. And when you mention that that um, that top-down statist approach, where uh, farmers were, were were forced into collectives, or uh, I suppose coerced into these collectives by, uh, if they weren't part of it, then they wouldn't get the resources, they wouldn't get the chemicals, and they wouldn't get the fertilizers that they needed. You also go on to write, and this is interesting, that this begins to make absolute sense then when you when you start to look through the change that's about to come around the corner. So this is the late 1970s, uh, mid 1980s. This period where the um, uh, the democratization movement really takes off and really become really hits the fore here and begins to make some grounds. And you're right; it's no surprise then that uh, that at this time when this change has happened, and it is also farmers that are out there challenging this top-down control of their lives. So I might get a touch on that, but also bring in this way in which the farmer is. It's almost reintroduced as a central moment and a central place within Korean life. So this is uh, Minjung ideology. And I think we touched on this in our last podcast a little bit. And I, again, I do encourage listeners to go back and listen to that. But it's a way in which the farmer is is once again reintroduced and re-centralized as this uh, essentially important person in Korean life. Yeah, so um, exactly. I mean, the the, the farmer... Uh, took a very central role, I would say, in the democracy movement um, and of the early 80s and um, leading up into 87. And um, I think it's exactly the reason that you're saying is um, in some, in many ways, they were the, um, I don't want, not the, 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 I don't want to use the victims, but they were the ones who were severely affected by these type of top-down authoritarian policies, right? Where um, they were very restrictive on what farmers could do and how they can live. Um, everyone talks about in the city about how the working class was op- uh, oppressed through poor working conditions and you know and, and, and very low wages, which is very true. But uh, equally so, you saw these kind of restrictions and uh, on farmers as well that ma- made life very hard f- for them for them and so they become the cent- they they do ag- participate um in the uh democracy movement um as a way to um express their um discontent and more importantly to kind of address uh, these uh, uh, these kind of uh, abuses uh, by the government um and interestingly enough you're right they do become I would say this is where they're becoming a little bit more romanticized. And what I mean by that is it's at this time that there are a number of people in the Minjung um, movement who uh, draw their ideas from Tongak, right? Tongak is uh, the the, um, peasant rebellions in the 1890s. Um, Tongak, of course, is a a Korean religion. And... um, what happened is a lot of Minjung um, activists um, created Tongak into a symbol um, where um, Tongak represented resistance against the state because that's what happened in the 1890s. These peasants resisting the state and resisting and going against Japanese imperialism. So they become this kind of, um, because of their the, this Tongak religion, they become very much um, farmers become romanticized as these uh, um, uh, the defenders of the Korean nation who could go up against the 
the Korean government. And I, this is where I would say there it's it's romanticized, and this is what happens very much often in a lot of social movements and in modern life, where farming life is uh, in agriculture and rural life is often romanticized. And, and people fail to see the deep realities and the struggles of what happens in, in rural life. But nevertheless, they are, they are, they are the center of, of, of these um, movements and they become um, very important symbols. And running through all of this, we should bring it in at this time. Um, is this um, Danish style cooperative system that comes in and it's got a deep history. I think it runs all the way back to the, to the colonial period. I'm currently from wrong, of course, but uh, it seems to run through and have a, a, a significant reach and appeal within Korean society. So what is this uh, Danish style system and its origins and uh, how successful was it? And I suppose really why was it so appealing to Koreans at this time? Right. I mean, that's like the most fascinating thing <laughs> is, you know, why why do Koreans love Denmark and the Danes and so forth? <laughs> I mean, I joke that you're right. I mean, I I personally, I mean, Copenhagen and Denmark, where I've gone there quite a few quite a few times and I, I i i i very much enjoy my visits there in part because i i also love um, i have deep interest in modern design and design furniture and so forth so so then when i when i did my research and i said gosh in the 1920s you know, a lot of people are talking about denmark i'm like gosh you know they're it's just more than furniture it's just more than modern design and 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 it, and it, and that's what it is. It's in the 20s and 30s throughout the world. Denmark was considered an agricultural paradise, in which the farmer was considered the center of society, the bedrock of society. Um, the belief was is that the Denmark, since the 19th century, had created um, a system, an economic system, th- with with the farmer at the center. And the farmers would work together cooperatively in these cooperatives, right? And a cooperative is where you share resources, share labor, um, and and it, with the hopes of 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 um, stabilizing your life as well um, as well as um, uh, producing more and so forth. Um, so it's this idea of uh, working together. Now, uh, in the the Danish, let's say, agriculture system, according to a lot of specialists, were was very successful. Farmers were doing well, and they're working together. And in particular, through the cooperatives, you notice that they were they were engaging in a different form of capitalism, a capitalism that is not all about just making money. It's about yes, in the process of trying to make a profit, you use those profits, or you use the process of 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 uh, trying to make money or profit um, as a way to have closer relations with other farmers f- to to form collective help. So cooperatives are very attractive. If you look in the, even now, when people talk about what are the alternatives to capitalism within capitalism, people like to talk about uh, cooperatives. So and uh, co-ops, um, which I think a lot of your listeners might be familiar with. And there's a lot of co-ops, of course, in Korea, um, like Han Salim and I Co-op and so forth. Um, but back to back to um, the 1920s, um, throughout the world, everyone saw Denmark as an agricultural paradise, uh, farmers doing well, and they were all working together. And it was a different form of capitalism. It was an ethical form of capitalism through cooperatives. Well, Koreans were very attracted to that. Um, they said, look, the, we're agricultural. We can do the same thing that the, the Danes doing. And so you had a lot of religious figures um, who I outlined in my first book, uh, Presbyterians, Chandogyo, uh, Methodists, um, who start trying to build Danish cooperatives. And that that extends all the way into post-1945. And, and, and you don't hear about it so much today, but um, in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, there was a lot of discussion still about Korea becoming another Denmark. So let's take another step forward in time here. Let's step into uh, the post-democratization uh, period. And, of course, so this is uh, early 90s onwards. And uh, the change that really hits agriculture 
at this time it, it seems to be of course what you might expect is once you uh, uh, at this time this is a, a push across the world for increased globalization this is the cold war is over and uh, everyone's talking about deregulation and liberalization and of course you now have a new lead uh, you now have a new democratic South Korea. So uh, I might you to touch on that period uh, and the pressures that seem to be uh, so important at this time. This is, of course, um, of course, not just uh, pressures for liberalization, but of course you have these overarching organizations coming in at this time. This is the, of course, the WTO. There's free trade org- organizations being signed across the world. So take us there, and I suppose the dramatic change that must have happened in not just people's lives, but particularly agriculture. Yeah, I, I, um, sure, I'd be happy to. So if you look at, um, let's say, the, in the late 80s, right? Um, well, let, let's take it back a little. Um, mm. Let's If you um, look at how the agricultural system existed in the 60s and 70s, it, it, it favored the farmers a great deal. In other words, it gave them a lot of protections. And what I mean by that is rice was heavily subsidized, where the state would buy a lot of rice and um, farmers would be guaranteed a price. So they could make quite a bit of money off of rice um, because the state would um, uh, guarantee these these high prices. So there was a lot of protection for farmers Um in this agricultural system, and things start to change by the late '80s into the uh, into late into the late '90s, and in large part, we have to, as you mentioned, look at the global landscape. How since the 1970s, um, you start to see right decentralization in terms of the economy, deregulation, liberalization. Um, a lot of people like you know uh, refer to that as the rise of the neoliberal uh, economy, and um, and neoliberalism does have its uh, uh, kind of influence in Korea uh, in the 70s and 80s, um, but particularly by the 90s when you're starting to see under Kim Young Sam's um, globalization campaign, where uh, there is this idea that in order for Korea to be this powerful global um, country, um, the, there parts of the economy needs to be deregulated because it was in many points heavily regulated and controlled by the central government, which in, in, you know, that partnership between the Chebrils and the, um, the central government worked very well, of course, in the seventies and eighties and even into the, into the nineties, but to make, you know, Samsung Hyundai even more um, competitive, there had to be deregulation as well as then there's this pressure from, um, countries like the United States, um, Western countries saying, look, um, you know, you need to deregulate your economy. You need to uh, make it more flexible. Um, and, and government can't be involved in, in, in anything. So it's at this point in the 1990s where you start seeing the government start making a lot of concessions um, in trade agreements. And what I mean by that is in order to increase the market share or um, the increase um, like Hyundai or Samsung's presence in a lot of countries, um, you you need to convince them to probably um, decrease some um, tariffs and other regulations that, would, that are prohibiting Korean companies from being competitive. Well, what the government says, look, said to a lot of company uh, countries saying, look, um, if you start to uh, repeal these tariffs or repeal a lot of these um, uh, kind of protections, form of protections, then what we'll do is we'll open up our agricultural market. And so what you start to see is that agriculture uh, is sacrificed for um, kind of urban industrial production. Um, and uh, free trade agreements are a perfect example of um, of um, of showing the, the 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 amount of sacrifice agriculture had to kind of experience because again, in these bilateral free trade agreements, South Korea would say, "Look, you open your economy to this number of uh, industries, um, and in return, we'll open up our agricultural sector." So. Um, so it, it, this this causes a lot of instability in the agricultural sector, and it makes farmers quite upset, of course. 
um, understandably. And this is where then the, the 90s and early 2000s is a really tough time for farmers. And of course, you had the Asian financial crisis that made things worse and increased neoliberalism in, in Korea. But it's a very tough time in the 1990s and 2000s for farmers. So let's talk about that, that instability and some of that difficulty. So, of course, this is when you talk about things like the 2008 um, beef protests, people o- often have a very clear idea of what that is. But there's also a whole series of protests around this time. And interestingly, you wrote here, and this might be a very interesting way to look at it. So you say it's the change that happened wasn't just a change, uh, this uh, free trade and a, a, a removal of protections. It wasn't just an economic or a physical thing. It also had a mental impact on the society around them. So, so this, the, instead of looking at uh, Korean farmers the way that they may have done during the democratization movement, Korean farmers were now looked at as um, they would they were once again just another aspect of an of of the economy. So uh, they 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 shouldn't expect special help from the public or for or, or from the government instead they should contribute they should uh produce what consumers want there's a whole new relationship that became with farmers and it seems like it, it, it's 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 very hard to understand all the dynamics at this time because protests like the 2008 protest was incredibly large and had a, a range of people involved in it but there seems to also be this change of consciousness around how farmers fit into this newly capitalized society yeah, I think that um yeah, it's uh with farmers um I think the criticism against them that that you're referring to is this criticism was this criticism of adaptation, you know, how, how come farmers can't adapt to the global economy like like workers are doing in the city. Um now in reality, that's a completely unfair argument to make against farmers because, um, you know, people in the cities working in these various professions, whether they be tech or uh, pharmaceutical or whatever, have very um, have these skills that can be um, used in different sectors and different industries. Right? They're very transferable. Um, Farming is a little different. I mean, it, it's a very specialized, particular type of 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 industry so um so uh quote i guess farmers can't be so flexible and they can't adapt as well as as maybe um city uh, uh, workers now so I, I i think there there is that criticism again against them um and i th- in it, but this is the interesting thing though um there is that criticism but on the other hand, there is still this love of this, again, romanticization of farming that you see frequently in South Korean society, where uh, a number of people, like especially after the IMF crisis. So after um, 98, you um, had a lot of people who were unemployed. Right. And what were they saying? A lot of them were saying, well, we need to go back to the rule. Um, we need to go back to farming because we actually have to um, we have to produce food and we can eat this food and we're, we're going to be self-sufficient. Um, and so all these types of kind of return to farming schools popped up in the late 1990s and early 2000s. Um, and and in in this idea of returning back to the land and return to farming, there's this idea that also farming will lead to a more moral and ethical life um, because it's so simple. And so you and I I think this is all again a romanticization of farming life because again farming is quite complex. There's a lot of struggles. There's a lot of conflict. Um, it is not as easy as people think, and so forth. Um, and so. But yeah, there's this romanticization. And th- this is, I mean, we can have a longer discussion later about this. But in, if you look at modern history, there's always been this romanticization of, of the rule, especially by urban people, because they want to, ex- the one way to escape the urban kind of issues that they face is to think about the simple rural, rural life. So that's, that's, that's really the romanticization is happening and still continues today. Um, and, and in Korea, very much a romanticization. What I think Hans Halim and a lot of organic farming groups have done very well is to educate 
Korean public about this is what farming is, this is what we want to create, and they're trying to create alternative systems of production and consumption and, and it being closer with the consumer and so forth. Um, the, the, the farming groups are doing, I think, a really good job of educating the public, and that's what the public needs. It's good education about what rural life is in agriculture. Let's uh, ask a couple of questions about the current state of this uh, this sector itself. So uh, you show quite importantly these uh, huge drop in rates of, uh, food, of food production inside South Korea. And it, I, I'm, I'm wondering, what is there a genuine fear or is there a fear within government or within society within Korea about food self, uh, self-sufficiency? So this is one of the things that many countries around the world and governments do tend to worry about from time to time. So is this sure. an a, a important issue within South Korea? And if so, how are they addressing it? Um, yeah, so I think, I think for this question, it's, it's, I think the way to look at it is um, food sovereignty and food security, right? So food sovereignty is um, uh, the belief that you produce enough um, food um, in, and so you're, you're in a way that you're not dependent on other areas or countries to, um, to um, provide um, the basic staples of, of food and so forth. Um, food security is, um, you know, the, the, the kind of, um, uh, the, the, I think a process to try to acquire as much food as you can through any means so that your country can be secure. So, um, what I would say today, South Korea is it is not a food sovereign country. It's a food security country. And that's because, um, because of our, uh, I think our the way the global economy has evolved, especially with agriculture, um, it's become a, a easier for the importing of agricultural goods into Korea, and it's it's not as expensive as it was in the uh, as before because there's not huge tariffs. So if you go to uh, Lotte Mart or you go to uh, any type of you know super in in Korea, and when you see like Chilean grapes, that, you know, whereas maybe 20 years ago, they would have been <laughs> really expensive. They're not so expensive anymore, like pineapple and bananas, right? I, I remember in the 80s when I go to Korea, th- some of those fruits were really expensive because it domestically produced grapes are really expensive. Um, and then importing grapes is also very expensive. But now it's not so expensive because you don't have as many, you don't have these tariffs. So um, I don't think it's a concern of the South Korean government because there is this kind of belief that you can constantly import your food. You don't have to rely on domestic production anymore, especially um, in this new in, in this new economy. So, um, but you know, that's not to say that the agricultural sector has disappeared. It's still very vibrant, but it's um, which I would give them a lot of resilience. They they are adapting. Um, and they are becoming more specialized in what they produce. Um, they, um, they also are doing a good job of um, farmers in Korea of directly sending their produce and products to the, to the cities um, so that um, there wouldn't be any middle person to take any cost. So, so agricultural cultivation, I think, is, 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 is I think recovering from the disasters of the 1990s and 2000s, but it's still very vulnerable, and I think it is still very much sacrificed and squeezed by the government. Still, what does the um, the landscape look like? Are these large scale farms? Because you write importantly that uh, at at a, a, a number of points throughout your research that. Uh, there should be more resource, more resources available for these small and medium-sized farms. And uh, so, I wonder what the actual landscape looks like in terms of farming, and also perhaps uh, what the government's current relationship with farming looks like. Is it still a a a, a pit, uh, paternalistic, top-down kind of structure, or is there much more consultation these days? Um. So a typical farm, right? If you, one thing that really distinguishes the farming landscape from like South Korea as opposed to the United States, you don't see huge agro farms. In other words, you don't see these large scale kind of farms made up of like tens and 20, 30, hundreds of acres, like you would see in the United States, uh, producing like a, 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 um, a singular crop like corn. 
that you see like all those types of farms in Iowa. Um, farms tend to be um, farmland uh, and ownership tends to be smaller in South Korea um, in large part because um, if you look at the constitution from the 60s, uh, 50s and 60s on, there was basically this mandate that no one could own uh, more than like three or four acres of land um, and to farm on those lands because you have to understand they didn't want to create an instance where you would have this huge accumulation of land and these huge landlords and then repeat what happened in the 20s and 30s where a large number of people are renting um, land from these these landlords. So they wanted to avoid that by saying, look, you can only have this amount of land and certain lands will be designated for, for farming. Um, so that's, it, it, there's tend to be small. There, you don't see a lot of um, uh, farms that are run by corporations, um, like, unlike you do find in Southeast Asia as well as in uh, the United States. Um, so they're very small. Um, and if you look, and they're usually run by families, um, mostly older older Koreans. They're they're using a lot of labor um, from people from Southeast Asia, South Asia, um, in the rural in the rural areas. Um, in terms of, of of government support or government relationship, I think it's it's different. Um, I think the government, um, what they're, they, it, you don't see the authoritarian top-down level that you may see in the 70s and 80s, although there is remnants of it still, like Nong Hyup, um, still is very powerful in the countryside. What you are starting to see is the government, uh, in some ways, I would say, ignores agriculture because, again, that's not the main driver of the economy. Um, and if they do pay attention, they're constantly advocating farmers to be more technologically savvy. So you want to create more techno farms, right? Integrating technology into farming. Um, so that's something that the government is trying to do. And again, I think, I think if you look at the history of agriculture, it's again, still the, the, I think a lot of farmers still need support, um, especially because they're aging. Um, and, but the government does not provide that, provide that support. So it's this kind of squeeze and abuse of farmers that I think is just uh, a quite quite horrible, I think, historically. And, 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 and it needs to be rectified in the sense of providing um, uh, enough aid and support to, to farmers so they can have a stable life. What does the um, environmental movement look like then? If farmers are being squeezed in this way, uh, I have to assume that the idea of an environmental movement is also being squeezed if indeed it has much pull at all because you put through your research and of course as you mentioned you have a book of course on the topic but um there's there, there are some notable projects you know this uh, grand canal project in 2008 where there are uh, restoration projects for some of the major rivers around uh, seoul and busan etc so but I wonder what it actually looks like in the long run and how it really survives because it, you have uh, some of your recent research and of course your book, it, it's a challenge to the way some people have understood the environmentalist movement in South Korea. It's got a much deeper history than people imagine. They often just run it forward from the period of industrialization itself. But uh, so with some of the history in mind, how should we see the environmental movement in Korea? And is, are there any links between it and the agricultural sector at all? Yeah, I mean, thanks for bringing that up. I think that, um, I mean, uh, my main argument is that the environmental movement started in rea reaction to agriculture. And um, why, why is that an argument that kind of should give people pause is, well, when we think about the causes of environmental issues or problems like pollution, we often um, attribute that to urban um, kind of dynamics and urban issues, as well as factories. So industrial factories, um, industrial work in the city. So the urban and industry often um, are thought as the um, kind of the drivers of, of environmental issues. And, and, and I would say they, they are, but if you look at in agriculture, agriculture has contributed a great deal to environmental degradation, not only in Korea, but th throughout the world. 
especially through um, chemical-based farming, through use of chemical fertilizers, pesticides, um, as well as farming itself is a very destructive act. It's a very destructive act on the land, right? Because you have to rip the land out. You're going to therefore reconstitute the ecology of an area so that you can produce certain crops, right? And usually um, in Korea and other places, it's a, it's a singular crop, not multi-crops, right? It's not, it's not uh, polycropping which is very problematic when you have only singular, only uh, planting one crop. So I would argue very firmly that environmental issues started really with, with agriculture since the colonial period, um, where, you know, pol uh, pesticides um, just are, if you know anything about pesticides, <laughs> and if you read anything by Rachel Carson, you would just see how destructive it is on the human body as well as on um on um on on insects um of course and and just um the non-human world um and uh right like if you think of ddt right one of the most destructive uh, pesticides that um cause cancer in, in humans as well as just destroyed ecology so you put it all together agriculture causes a lot of environmental destruction so that happened in korea and um what I found in my, a lot of my research is there's a lot of environmental movements that started in the 70s and 80s. And what I've seen is, and I've interviewed a lot of the, the leaders of these movements, is that they, they learned a lot about environmental issues from what they saw was happening to the land through farming right, through pesticides and fertilizers, how people were getting cancer through pesticides, how, how animals, some animals were dying because they're consuming accidentally all this pesticide, how just lands are deteriorating, and in and, and, and many ways how, um, you know, um, kind of uh, uh, prairies and these, these really lush uh, areas were just being destroyed because they had to uh, become farmland. So, so, I think collect and 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 also interesting interestingly enough, it, it all these um, uh, environmental actors really um, of the seventies and eighties were really um, affected by um, agricultural destruction, how it destroyed um, the environment. So I make a lot of connections in saying that there is this relationship between agriculture and, and, and environmental movements. And um, if you look at if you look at um, if you look at uh, Han Salim and groups today, um, you will see that they have a very uh, environment, very environmental conscious because they promote organic farming. So that's as a final question, try and draw a few more links then uh, again. So <clears throat> we're speaking about agriculturalism, uh, uh, cooperatives, uh, environmentalism, all these changes, but a huge theme in your research is this um, uh, a focus on how people have tried and perhaps a future in which we need to develop a new moral economy of some sort for these sectors. So, and, and of course, you draw this in, interesting inference for, to the uh, to um, America and the organic food movement, which you say has done this really impressive job of not just improving how it has developed, but also drawing people in and bringing their attention towards the, a, a social problem that they're trying to address within society itself. So, I mean, that's, just, of course, just an example there. But I wonder how you see the future of these movements, this, uh, the future of cooperatives in South Korea, the future of agriculture, the future of the environmental movement. I know that's a fairly broad question, of course, but I wonder how you see the future and whether uh, how risky it may be, whether you think there, there's significant challenges ahead or just what it might look like. Yeah, I mean, I it's yeah, it's always hard to <laughs> kind of envision the future because you know historians like to think about the past too much. <laughs> um, but you know that doesn't stop me from thinking about what's going to happen to um, agriculture, the environment, and um, interrelated things in the future. And I would, I mean, I, my my belief, especially based on my research, is these type of agricultural organic organizations like Han Salim, I Co-op, Pulmu, Pulmu School, um, Cheng Nong Hui, um, these, these very well-known organic farming groups um, are leading the way for uh, 
um, social renewal in South Korean society, in which um, social renewal would not only mean um, social and economic and uh, social and economic equality, um, promoting um, those two things, as well as uh, environmental sustainability, and they all tie them together, uh, um, of course. Where um, you know, if you look at these groups, at the heart of it is this idea of interconnection, the need for interconnection between the human and human, and the human and non-human, and uh, all these groups have. Uh, what they think about then is what are the mechanisms that we can create where uh, you can have strong moral ethical relations between humans and humans, humans and non-humans. And the cooperative economy that I mentioned earlier is one mechanism in which it may um, kind of not necessarily suppress capitalism and its principles, but tame it in a way where the profit doesn't become or the capital doesn't become the dominating force. Instead, what, what the cooperative does is to create strong social relationships, strong social relationships between farmers, but also between the farmers and, and, and consumers. So, I, you know, I, I, and this is something that I'm going to be writing over the next couple of months, is to look at about how they're creating this type of social renewal in South Korea society, which I believe is facing a crisis in which the direction of the country about you know, there's a lot of discontent um, over education, um, gross social and economic inequality, and people are looking for avenues for renewal. And I think the organic farming groups um, provide that. And that's also a wonderful note to end the podcast on as well. So uh, the links that I've used and the, the articles and the books that I've used as reference for this podcast, I'm going to link below where they can all be accessed. And I do encourage people to go and read them for themselves. They're all fascinating, all incredibly interesting, as well as our previous podcast, which I believe was episode 51, which I am also going to link below and, of course, get a different aspect on some of Albert's research. So... On that, Albert Park, thanks for coming to the podcast again. Oh, thanks so much, Jed. I really appreciate the opportunity to kind of to talk with you and to kind of share my um, kind of views of history and so forth. It's always, it's always a pleasure talking with you. Thank you for listening to this episode of the podcast. I really hope you enjoyed it. This is just a final reminder that we've made a conscious decision here on the Korean App Podcast not to run advertising. And so the podcast is entirely funded by you, the listener. So if you do want it to continue, please consider supporting the podcast at the PayPal or Patreon links attached below. Or importantly, you can share, like, or comment on the podcast across social media. And on that, I hope to see you again for the next episode. Thanks again for listening.